The following is a presentation of Seaside Community Baptist Church. introduce first the guys who I have with me. So these are four students from our center. So we have Ivan and David, Andre and Sean. And as pastor said, my name is Tasha. I'm the administrative assistant at Teen Challenge and I am just happy to be here with you guys today to tell you about our program. Although we've been here, there might be new people. So is there anyone who has not heard of Teen Challenge and expected to see 15 year olds here today maybe? So there's a few of you here. So uh, a little bit about Teen Challenge is Teen Challenge was uh, started by Pastor David Wilkerson back in 1958. And it all started from him just being obedient to God. And he felt that he needed uh, to be more devoted in his prayer time. And so he sold his television and devoted that time. He would normally watch TV to prayer. And one night while he was praying, he saw in a magazine that there were boys in New York that were on trial for the murder of a young handicapped boy. And that just really spoke to him. Um, being from a small town in Pennsylvania, he likely had no experience with gangs and not a lot of experience with youth in that sense. So he spoke to his church, gathered up their blessings and a little bit of money and went to New York. And he went to that courthouse very naively, feeling like he could speak on behalf of these boys who he had never met to the judge. And uh, he was actually thrown out of court for it. It's very different uh, than what we see today and, and what we would see in courts uh, as far as a pastor being welcome. And when he got out to the lobby of the courthouse, a news reporter had asked him who he was and what are you doing here? And he was happy to tell them. But the news reporter said, well, what's that in your hand, a Bible? Hold it up. And so he held that Bible up really proud, and they snapped a picture and put it on the front page of the newspaper. Now, if we were to see that today, we'd probably be very happy to see God, a man of God, on the front page of the newspaper. But in 1958, little skinny preachers from small churches in Pennsylvania were, should not have been on the front page of the newspaper. And uh, he was a little bit defeated, couldn't really figure out why he felt called to come to New York, and God had just shut him out. And he was actually walking back to his car the next day, and someone had stopped him and said, hey, I know you. You're the preacher from the newspaper. And that was his in. That was his in to gangs and street kids of New York. And through that, he held rallies, he spoke on, on street corners, really unsure of the vision, the final vision that God had been giving him little by little. And as doors closed, windows opened for Pastor Wilkerson. And eventually, one day, after a youth rally, he had this vision that, that youth in New York and maybe even all over America needed a place where they could find freedom from addictions um, they were homeless. They needed a place where they could go and really be poured into. And that is how Teen Challenge started. Coincidentally enough, or not coincidentally, um, as God has a perfect plan, the building that we're currently in, in Memram Cook, which is just outside of Moncton, was built in 1958. Uh, it was a monastery and then used for training and retreats for some time before we were able to take it over. So. I know we say that God knew that we needed it, just we weren't ready for it, so he built it up for us. And today we have 15 students in our center, two interns who live there, which are phase four, so once they graduate, they stay on and develop additional leadership skills and maybe build up a little bit of a resume and before they go home. So we have many staff. And as of today, there are six centers all over Canada, Teen Challenge, 
uh, more than six centers, but six under Teen Challenge Canada. And next year, there will be a women's center opening in St. John's, Newfoundland. And there are more than 1,100 centers worldwide in 118 countries. There's tens of thousands of beds in Teen Challenge centers that God is using to deliver men and women from drug addiction all over the world because one person, one person was obedient to Christ, sold his TV, and just prayed. That's all it took. Uh, so before I speak more about the program, I want to invite Ivan, Andre, and Sean up, just up here to the front, uh, to do uh, Reality Is. You want to know what reality is? Reality is within one year, both your older brothers are kicked out of your house and in jail because of drugs. Reality is having an addiction to painkillers, and your older brother showing you how to shoot them up at the age of 15. Reality is finally meeting your biological mother after 16 years, and the only thing we remember from that experience is smoking crack and drinking alcohol with her. Reality is dropping out of college, spending an $18,000 student loan a month because your addiction is more important than education. Reality? Reality is your older brother spending eight years in prison, being released, and two weeks later he is drugged and murdered in his apartment. How do I know that's reality? Because that was me. Reality is being nine years old, hating school, not wanting to go out of the fear of what physical and verbal bullying you were going to have to endure that day. Reality is getting so drunk, you wake up in strange places, next to people you don't know, not knowing how you got there or where you are on a regular basis. Reality is your addictions turning you into a person that you always despised, an unemployed, lying, manipulative, freeloading thief. Reality is being 40 years old, not being able to support yourself, living with and stealing from your 81-year-old mother to get high. Reality is, uh, after smoking crack for 36 hours straight, you're filled with so much guilt and self-hatred that you just want to kill yourself. How do I know that's reality? Because that was me. Reality is spending all your money on cocaine and expecting someone else to feed you and pay your bills. Reality is being high for so long you forget you're a father, a grandfather, or even a human being. Reality is knowing that the next hit of crack cocaine you take could be your last. Reality is you live in darkness and fear the light. Reality is selling all you have for another hit of cocaine and leaving you homeless. Now, although we've all had different realities, we've all been saved by the same truth. The truth is, I admitted I had a problem. By the grace of God, I am alive. The truth is, my father can finally look at me and say, Son, I am proud of who you are and the man that you've become. The truth is, I rededicated my life to Jesus Christ, and it's through him I find my strength. The truth is, God showed me how to have true and meaningful relationships, and through him I found 14 new brothers at the center. And truth is, I'm no longer ashamed of who I am, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. The truth is, God's perfect love helps me overcome all my fears on a daily basis. Reality is, sorry. <laughs> truth is, um, Thanks to God and uh, through my counseling at Teen Challenge, I now understand why I abused drugs and alcohol for so many years. Truth is, uh, I now measure my self-worth through God's eyes. I'm a child of his, perfect in his eyes. Truth is, God has forgiven me. I've been able to forgive others. And most importantly, I've forgiven myself. Truth is, for the first time in decades, I have hope for a future because I'm a new creation through Jesus Christ.
Truth is, when I came to Teen Challenge, my family slept better, and so did I. Truth is, seven months ago, I had no hope of seeing heaven. Now it's my only hope. Truth is, I gave up drugs. Since I gave up drugs, my son and his family and my sister and her family drove 1,500 kilometers just to see me. Truth is, because I came to Teen Challenge, my relationship with my family has been restored. Truth is, in just seven months, I have overcome the cravings of drugs and have gained 50 pounds. Proverbs 8 and 7. My mouth speaks what is true, but my lips detest wickedness. Psalm 91, verse 4. He shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. Matthew 7 and 12. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father except through me. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the, the truth, truth shall, shall set, set you free. So, amen, right? <laughs> uh, your reality may not look like Andre's or Sean's or Ivan's, but the truth is that we all have our own reality. Um, the re reality for me is that I didn't just come to Teen Challenge a year and a half ago as an administrative assistant, but my story with, Ch with Teen Challenge started after about six years of marriage, or six months of marriage, sorry, I found out that my husband was using cocaine. And in that, that devastating truth unraveled a ton of things that I was not aware of. We planned, at that point, we were actually separated. He wasn't even living in our home. We weren't even speaking. And when I found out, I decided that he needed uh, our own <laughs> intervention kind of thing. And I asked him to come home, and we went out of town. And the plan was to after the weekend, so I could keep him away from friends so that he wouldn't find out that I knew, the plan was to take him to family and we were gonna confront him. But that fell through while I was out of town and I knew I had to do it myself. And I was afraid. I didn't know what his reaction would be. Um, by now I had actually noticed him using all weekend. Here we were at a weekend a way to try to repair the damage to our marriage and he was still using uh, within every hour maybe going to the washroom to use without me knowing of course um, i confronted him and he admitted yeah he uses it's not a problem i can stop which is what you might have heard before and if you have a family member or a friend i can stop and i will tell you he did he didn't use cocaine again but what happened is he did try to do that in his own strength and he ended up uh, with depression and a suicide attempt and in that attempt um, I had wanted him to go to teen challenge and he denied so when he was released from the hospital he couldn't come home and luckily we had some really great friends who loved Jesus and we had a friend who had graduated from teen challenge and those friends got together with him and kind of tricked him into coming over where there was a computer and an application. And he got it. He filled out the application. And within one week, one and a half weeks, he was gracing the doors of Teen Challenge and Memram Cook. Uh, in 2011, he graduated. We moved our family from Dartmouth to Moncton to restart a new life together. And I'm telling you this because Teen Challenge is a vessel that Jesus Christ is using to change lives. So you've heard it from a reality to a truth here. But our truth is that my husband went from, uh, in his former days, you know, being involved in gang activity, selling drugs, then becoming an adult and using drugs in our marriage, lying, deceiving. Today he works for a Christian university. He manages a store full-time, and he's had the privilege through his own ministry to go right across the country and witness thousands of youth give their life to Christ. Like that, that is the truth that every person here could have. 
at Teen Challenge, we get to see those truths often. Uh, we have guys who go through our program for one entire year. They graduate, uh, which is always a fantastic event. Uh, we actually have a graduation in a couple of weeks. Some of you may have met John uh, during our choir tour. He's graduating on December 3rd. And that friend who we knew who graduated Teen Challenge beforehand is actually John's son. So when we talk about Teen Challenge and our students, the, this ministry is impacting entire families because John's son went through the program and graduated and he witnessed that change. John came through the program. John has been delivered from his addictions and he's going to start a brand new life with Jesus first when he leaves. At Teen Challenge, uh, we do have staff. We have probably the best staff, I think, in uh, all of Atlantic Canada, for sure, at any organization. But we are there to um, provide support and administrative duties. But our guys are responsible for everything that happens at that center. We've got a beautiful property on 18 acres of land, and they mow it. They do the snow removal. They dust. They clean windows. They sweep. They mop. They cook. They do it all. They do laundry. And I remember when my husband was in the program and he said, uh, do you want to be humbled? Do Wash the underwear of 14 men that you get to live with. That will humble you. And so that's a chore that our guys have to do. Uh, days are very structured. They have work therapy, PACE, uh, which is individual book reading and contract work. They also have biblical study class. Uh, well, they will just learn different principles of the Bible, how we apply them to our life. So being a father, being a man, what that means. Um, sometimes there's some financial classes. They are really learning how to take the 12 months that they're in Teen Challenge and put it into everyday life. We're going to have a chance to ask them some questions about the program. But before we do that, I'm going to get David to come up. Uh, it's pretty exciting for me, probably nerve-wracking for David, because this is the first time David has ever ch shared his testimony uh, in a service before. So uh, please make him feel welcome. Yeah, David. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to take a moment of silence for four close friends of mine I lost to drug addiction. Cody Coombs, Stephen Fitz, Brad Rideout, and Brendan Parsons. I'll never forget you boys. You'll always be here with me. Psalm 42, 11. Though you have made me see troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. I stand here today to tell you a story of failure, regret, and redemption. This is my story. My name is David Padier. I am from Bay Roberts, Newfoundland, born 1990, July 3rd. I was brought up in a great home. My mom and dad were both teachers, and I have a sister five years older than me. I grew up with everything a boy could ever want. I was popular, played sports, my best being hockey. I always had the best of the best, whatever it was, whether it be clothes, racing dirt bikes and quads, or whatever I was involved in at the time. I was given every possible opportunity to succeed in life. Growing up, my parents did their best to raise me in a Catholic church where we would attend church every Sunday as a family. As I got older, I started to go to church less and less till I didn't go at all. Eventually, I had lost all faith in our Lord, deciding that there was no God, believing that after death there was only darkness, like when you fall asleep and wake up in the next morning not having dreamed, no memory of what happened in between. Psalm 14:1. The man is a fool who says to himself, there is no God. Anyone who talks like this is wrapped in evil and cannot really be a good person at all. Once I lost faith, I lost everything else along with it. Growing up in my early teen years, I began trying new things. 
wanted to experience as much as possible like most kids my age at the time. At the age of 14, I started hanging out with different groups of people where I started to experiment with weed. At first, I smoked weed socially, bringing me to meet people from all walks of life and making many new friends. At the time, I thought this was a great way to grow. By grade 10, I was smoking up to four to five times a day, really attending school, and started to sell drugs. That summer, I was introduced to acid and ecstasy. I remember the first time I tried ecstasy was also the first time I had ever gone to a club. I was 16 years old at an e-club in downtown St. John's, hanging out with people six to seven years older than me. This made me feel important, giving me a false sense of happiness. During the next eight to nine months of that year, I started taking ecstasy every time I went to a party, which I was doing three to four times a week. By the time I went back to school for grade 11, I was one of the main go-to guys for E in our, in our age group in our area. Me and my friends started picking them up by the hundreds. This gave me my first taste of easy mo money, and from that moment on, I had decided I wanted to pursue becoming a drug dealer for my life profession, taking me down a road of misery and destruction. It was the winter of my grade 12, and I was on the way to one of my good buddies' parties with a few close friends. At this time in my life, all my friends had started experimenting with a drug called Oxycontin that was just starting to become popular in our area. I had never had any interest in myself, Knowing that it was a very addictive drug, both physically and mentally, I had never tried it. But on this particular night, I was very angry and upset and wanted to feel better no matter what. I remember my friends telling me it would make me feel like a million bucks, taking away my worries. With that, I decided to try it. I think I had the willpower to use it just that one time, and that would be it. Boy, was I ever wrong. It went from once to once a week to once every couple of days, to once a day, till it came to the point where I was doing it a few times a day and could not go without it, without becoming both mentally and physically sick. It quickly started to consume all the money I was making from selling various types of drugs. It quickly put me in debt with the wrong people. This went on for the next nine years as my addiction got worse and worse. I started going from doctor to doctor getting prescribed methadone and failing the program then having my family doctor putting me on a bridge program prescribing me Oxycontin until I could get back on the methadone program so I didn't go back in debt and wasn't out stealing to pay for my habit. This happened five times to me from the age of 19 to 25 until it got to the point where no methadone doctor in Newfoundland would accept me back. During this tormenting cycle of pain, my addiction got worse and worse as my tolerance grew. By the age of 22, I had become an IV user not being able to get out of bed in the morning without poking myself in the arm. At this point in my life, my addiction had taken over my whole life. I had lost everything and everyone that ever mattered to me, and most importantly, I had lost myself. I had lost all hope of ever recovering. From the age of 22 till ju just last summer, my life was all about how I was going to get my next fix causing me to get deeply involved into the criminal lifestyle, stealing and hurting everyone around me, only caring about myself and not caring about who I hurt along the way. This lifestyle caused me to move around a lot, never staying in one place for more than a couple of months and always having to look over my shoulder. It didn't take long for my guilt and shame to catch up with me to the point where I truly hated who I had become. I decided I would be better off dead for my sake and my family's. At the age of 25, I attempted suicide twice during December 2015. I was then put in a psych ward where I got a chance to see straight and flush the drugs out of my system. Not long after that, my parents let me move back home with them for a short amount of time till I could get back on my feet. They gave me a place to stay as long as I could stay clean and try to find work. I thought my battle was over. I thought that just from being clean, my life would start to piece itself back together. But once again, I was wrong. The truth is, I was too broken for it to be that simple. A few months after moving home with my parents and staying clean, I started hanging out with some old friends that still lived in the area. After a few months of not being able to find work, I decided to start selling drugs again. In a short amount of time, I was back into a full-blown addiction, and my parents kicked me out of the house once they found out what I was doing. 
They didn't want anything to do with me anymore. The guilt of my past had devoured me, and I came to hate the person I had become. I wanted my life back. I came to the understanding that I needed some type of reconciliation. Once I realized this, I immediately got myself to Teen Challenge. Since coming to Teen Challenge, I've realized that having God in my life is the key to living a happy and sober life. I have confessed and repented, giving myself to our Savior. I've been baptized where the Spirit filled me with warmth, and I left my guilt behind, becoming a child of God. I know now that I will receive the reconciliation I so craved only through following God's word and trying to live up to it to the best of my ability. Matthew 6:33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. I stand here today to testify that our God saves all who put their faith in him. He has taken me out of the darkness and into the light. Here I will stay and forever glorify him. He has brought me a new life. Great job, Dave. <laughs> I know you're a little nervous. You did a really good job. Thank you. Uh, so at Teen Challenge, so we've heard Dave's story. He was able to come to Teen Challenge. Um, we expect only $1,100 from each student who enters the program, so $1,100 for an entire 12-month program. If you have kids at home, you know that's a food budget for sure. I have two teenagers at home, and uh, we're easily doing that in a month. Um, how we keep our doors open is by coming here, being invited by churches like yours, being able to share our story, our story of hope, uh, that hope can be found. And if you leave here today with just knowing that if it can happen to these guys, if it can happen to my family, then it can happen to you, yours, then we have done our job. But if you feel that you want to do more, that you want to bless this ministry so we can continue to do what we're doing so that guys like Dave can find freedom from their own addiction. And then there's a couple of ways that you can do that. Um, also, just remember to be praying for us, for our guys, for future students, for your own family. You cannot cease in prayer. Um, someone like Ivan, his family would have been praying for a very long time. And seven months ago, their prayers were answered. Right? So never cease in prayer. A couple of ways that you can help us uh, is by a one-time gift. We do have some envelopes here that you can put that gift in. We're a charitable, don a charitable donation, so you will get a receipt at the end of the year. But if you wanted to even do a little bit more than that, we have a sponsorship program. Much like other sponsorship programs that you might be more familiar with, you will receive a card just like this. And today, you might take one home that has David's face in it. He's brand new, so you may be the very first sponsor, very first person to be able to sponsor David and hang his face on your fridge or keep it in your Bible so you can pray him through those hard days. The great thing about sponsorship is you can be more involved in your student's life. You can choose to just send that check off, pray for him on your own. It's more than enough. But there are days when the guys are just so down and a letter comes in the mail and they get called to the office to get that mail and someone inside who doesn't know them sends a message of encouragement that maybe their family's been telling them for the last five months and maybe the staff is saying it and their brothers in the program are saying it. But there's something about when that encouragement or that, that prayer, that scripture comes from someone that they don't know who isn't expected to care about them, that they thought enough to send a letter or send a card in the mail just for them, just to encourage them. That's huge. I can tell you, um, my husband, he graduated in 2010, 2011, sorry. He still has a shoebox filled with every card, every letter that he ever received from any sponsor that he had. Those, they mean something. Most of our graduates would say they have that exact same shoebox stuck up in a corner somewhere that they might reach to when they need 
a lift, a little bit of encouragement. So I want to encourage you today to join us and partner with us in sponsorship. It's $40 a month. Um, and this isn't to come from any obligation that you already have for your, your tithes and your offerings for your church or any other organizations that's close to your heart. Uh, we want, if you feel called, this to be something new. So if God has been saying to you that you need to partner, we want you to do something, we want you to invest in somebody, this might be it today. We have other students as well. Uh, as I said, we have 15 students. I think we have seven of them in our sponsorship program right now. So you can choose to sponsor David or you can sponsor somebody else. But this is what's going to make the difference. This is what makes the difference in guys who need that, that one word to stay. No one will tell you they got through that program really easy. Every single person gets to graduation day wanting to quit a dozen times. It's hard. It's a ridiculously hard program. And those letters and that encouragement make a really big difference. I want to pray for you guys. Uh, actually, before we do that, because I think we still have a little bit of time, just a few minutes, if there are any questions, we'll get the guys up. And you can ask anything you like, and someone can answer that. Are there any questions about programs, student life, uh, anything like that? Anyone? We cleared it all up? Ah, there we go. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Here you go. Who'd like to take it? Um... <laughs> uh, a normal day uh, for us starts at uh, 6.45 a.m. Uh, that's wake up. Uh, at 7.15 till 7.45, we do devotions and prayers. Um, at 7.45, we eat breakfast. From about 8.15 till 9.15, we get ready for the day and we do chores, uh, cleaning up the house, cleaning up after breakfast, etc. Um, three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, we have chapel service uh, from 9.15 to 10.15. And then after that, we have class uh, Monday and Wednesday. Sorry, yeah, Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, we have class uh, until 11.30. Then we have lunch. And then after that, at around 1.15, uh, we do work therapy uh, for the rest of the day until 4.30. Work therapy can be cutting the lawn, it can be um, gardening, it can be cleaning, you know, dusting shelves, it can be vacuuming rooms, um, it could be cleaning windows, uh, putting in air conditioners, uh, all kinds of things. Basically, the general upkeep of the property and uh, maintaining it, uh, cooking, that type of thing. Uh, and then in the evening, we eat dinner around 5 o'clock. Afterwards, uh, we have some free time until 7. And then uh, Monday and Wednesday, we have uh, PACE, uh, which is uh, our personal work studies uh, for an hour. And then uh, at uh, 8.45, we do, um, uh, we do dorm prayer, uh, Monday, Wednesdays. Uh, the other nights, the other days, uh, are just slightly different. We do, instead of chapel and group, we do uh, group and pace, uh, so group therapy and pace. And then in the evenings, uh, we have recreation and um, uh, worship. Sorry, sorry. So that's, that's our typical day. Yeah. Great. I may have missed it as I was racking my brain to think of anything that I might have forgotten to tell you guys. Um, but we also have a certified addictions counselor, and the guys every week will all have a session with her uh, on top of the group counseling as well. Anyone else with questions? Yeah. Absolutely. As of right now, I believe it's the fall. Is that right? Of next year? Next fall. Um, and it's for women, yeah, in St. John's, Newfoundland. So we're really looking forward to that. There is a women's center in Ontario right now, but we're very happy to have one in Atlantic Canada for sure. 
Anybody else? Our, our guys are all here voluntarily. Um, so they may very well have their own referral story, whether it was a friend who told them about it or a nurse at, the, at a, a detox center. But, or yeah, this is really how many people hear about our program. So know that, that it's you who will tell someone, hey, these people came here, you should check them out. Or you tell a friend who has a friend we're all, we're all connected to somebody who's suffering in addiction. It's just the unfortunate reality that we have here in Atlantic Canada. Uh, I do want to make sure that anybody who needs an envelope or a sponsorship form gets one. So if you would like to have one, if you could just raise your hand and we'll have Ivan and Dave get one to you. And we'll pray, but also I, we're going to be kicking around that back table, so please... If you have another question, you can come by, and any one of the guys will be able to answer it for you. Yeah. Oh, sure. All right. Um, so you basically came us to tell us this morning that Christ sets people free. Is that right? Yes. Amen. So I want you to guys to join me up on the stage, and we are going to pray for this city, for our people. Probably you know somebody who is addicted or is struggling with addiction. Probably you are here today. Or perhaps you know somebody is going through those things. You who have been set free, can you join with me and we'll pray. Is that okay? All right. Let's all stand together. And anybody else who has been set free, would you come up and join me up here as well? Our very own Reese has a story, and he'll share someday with us. He's from South Africa, and he, he tells me only one thing. He's absolutely convinced, and he knows it for sure that Christ alone sets people free. Amen? You agree? I definitely agree, Pastor. God is the only one that can set us free. Amen. Amen? And this Mark Heber, our very own. And there are people here who are involved in ministry or dealing with such uh, situations. And we have a school, Sir John A., right next door, who's having a major problem with drug issues. Randy Duggan, who's a teacher there, is standing to bear witness. And I know his heart breaks when he thinks about the young people. So we're going to take this time, and you guys are going to help Seaside to pray. All right? Thank you. Loving Heavenly Father, we come before you and stand to bear witness to a Christ who exists yesterday, today, and forever. Once again, we see lives upon this stage who have been transformed by your miraculous power. The Bible says you didn't come into this world to come condemn the world, but you came to set people free. There might be people sitting in this room living a life of condemnation and hopelessness. Father, hear our testimonies to attest the fact that Christ sets people free. You came to open the eyes of the blind. You came to open the ears of the deaf. You came so that our hearts will be open. You came so that we captives would be set free to walk out of those prisons. If there's anyone here, Father, who's being held captive by the enemy, who's bent upon stealing, killing, and destroying uh, people in this world, I humbly pray that would you would rise like a man of war, set the twigs ablaze, and set the captives free. We humbly pray for any young man, young woman, older man, older woman, anybody who is in any form of addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or any form of evil, Father, that exists in this world, and they're crying out for help, and there's nobody you can see their cry besides you. I humbly pray. Would you swoop down from heaven with your eye upon our bodies, Father God? Would you deliver these people? Would you deliver all of us? Deliver this city from this bondage. And Father God, show yourself strong on our behalf, on our brother's behalf. And may this testimony resound to the ends of the earth, Father God. 
We humbly pray, O oh Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one whose name is above all names, the one whose name, at, at his name every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, and every demon shall tremble. To this name we appeal, and Father, we remember the people that we know who are afflicted at this moment, who have been held captive at this moment, and there are people in our lives that we have given up on, thinking that there is no hope for them, just like a brother shared that he has gone back five times. And Father, there are people who go back again and again, and they have given up on their life. Father, this is your opportunity. Father, may this day be the day where you show your deliverance. You said you are our deliverer. You said you are our refuge and our strong tower, the one who sets people free. We pray for Sir John A. We pray for this school. We pray for our universities. We pray for the schools around us. We pray for our teenagers. And we pray for everyone, Lord, who's held captive, whether it's secretly or not secretly, Father, whether they're caught or not caught. Oh, Jesus, you alone can set people free. Oh, Lord, you came into this world, and this truth that you deliver rings true with our own lives and we humbly pray that you would prove it once again. We humbly pray for Teen Challenge Ministry and we pray God, you bless these people, let them multiply, let finances not be an issue so that they can go forth and cast those nets and when their nets are full and they're ready to break, oh God, that you would give that sustenance and that endurance to the leaders and the staff. We humbly pray God, that they would have their place open all times to receive the need which is enormous all around, to counsel them, lead in the way of truth, and also show them how Christ is so real, so bent upon changing lives. We humbly pray that this day, Lord, in Seaside's moment, in, uh, in Teen Challenge's moment, I pray, Lord, this day, would be the day when things are falling apart all, uh, all around us. May they have the hope to continue the good work that you've begun in their lives. We give you all the glory and honor for the ability that you show in each and every one of us. And we humbly pray for all these brothers. May they continue to remain humble and sincere and passionate to see others delivered. Oh God, provide for their needs, provide for their families. And I can't imagine the joy that we have, the families have, when they behold their children who are set free. Thank you, Father. We give you all the glory and honor. Thank you for this wonderful morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us. And we hope you've been blessed by today's teaching. We hope you would join us weekly in pursuing God through His Word. If you would like to learn more, please join our Discipleship School. You can find us at seasidecommunity.org, YouTube, or Facebook. We always enjoy our listeners' feedback, so send your comments and prayer requests to info at seasidecommunity.org. We would love to hear from you. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you always.